I hope you, you will permit me to jump ahead a little bit in the book of Genesis today. Uh, we just uh, finished chapter 15 last week, and I just want to take a few verses, just a segment of verses, one section, out of Genesis chapter 18 this morning. I believe this is where the Lord led me uh, as far as a briefer message today. This is not going to be uh, a full-blown message as a, a normal Sunday morning. Uh, that is, if I can help it. Uh, Genesis chapter 18, and I want to focus in on verses 16 through 22 in particular. Now, this is the account in which Abram and God have a conversation. I mean a conversation like you and I would have a conversation. Because Abram is sitting under a tree near his tent in the desert, and uh, three men he sees approaching. And uh, he gets up and he runs to greet them. These three men, we, are, we find out as we read the account in Genesis 18, two of them are angels, and the third one is God manifest in a human body. Which incidentally, for those of you that might be listening to me that are Jewish and don't believe that Messiah could be a human being, how do you explain that third visitor that came to Abram's tent? That's incidental to what I want to say. The fact of the matter is, they had a meal together that Sarah and the servants prepared for them. And then the visitors began to dismiss themselves and to leave. The three of them walked, and they got to a certain spot. And it says uh, in verse 16, the men rose up, Genesis 18, 16, for those that just popped in. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, and he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. I would simply submit to you that Abraham had a tremendous encounter with God. And I want to ask you, in your heart, have you ever had a real encounter with God? Perhaps not on this level, obviously, but have you had any recent encounter with God? I'm convinced that God wants people that he can reveal both himself and his plan to. That's what I see happening here. God is always looking for believers who are interested enough to go with him and to listen to what he's doing and then to have them join him in his purpose. If you're not really interested in what God's doing, you know what? He's going to hide his plan from you. You're going to be oblivious to it. You're not going to know it. But he really wants to share it with you because he wants you to have a part in what he really wants to see get done on this earth. And I think that that's what not only this passage is about, but I think that's what this gathering this morning is about. When we set aside as led by the Lord a day of prayer where we seek the presence of God, 
on the behalf of this city and the cities of this nation, I think what, we're, what our gathering uh, means is that we are seeking to join in what God wants to do. I don't think that this kind of calling is just dreamed up in our hearts. Look, the flesh does not want to spend time in prayer with God. The flesh is not uh, looking to enter into the presence of God. That's the last thing. And in my flesh, I don't like doing it. But I believe that God has moved us to do this. He wants us to have an encounter with him. Not exactly like Abraham, but I believe that if we're going to join God in this, you have to join Abraham and be a, a select company of those that would intercede, those that would go to bat, so to speak, for people that don't even think of God, don't even care about God, would never pray to God, would never have an encounter with Him, we intercede, we, we step in between them and God and beseech Him on their behalf. So I'm going to share three thoughts about God in His dealing with Abraham in this passage that I hope will really grab hold of our hearts and will prepare us for our meeting, our encounter with God, however it, it, uh, it turns out in our time here today. So let's pause a moment and pray. Our Lord, we know that you want to meet with us. I would, God, that we would be just as excited, just as enthused, just as ready to meet with you Lord, I pray that this day would not be a disappointment to you. That we would not disappoint you by not stepping up to the plate, so to speak, and interceding on the behalf of a sinful people that we're a part of in this city and this nation. Lord, take the truth, these simple truths of your meeting with Abraham and use it in our hearts in the way that you see fit. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things in that passage that I read to you just a moment ago that really jumps out to me is that what God's doing here. You know what he's doing? God is divulging. God's divulging. God is not hiding his plan from Abraham. But he is rather being very transparent and open with him. And so we see God divulging here. But I love verse 16, or 17, because here we see God talking to himself. Do you talk to yourself? They used to tell us when we were, I remember when we were younger, if you, if you talk to yourself, uh, that's a sign of mental illness. And uh, it's confirmed when you answer yourself. <laughs> hey, I talk to myself. I think we all do. God talked to himself here. Isn't that interesting? Look at what he says. He's questioning himself in verse 17. And the Lord, and by the way, the word Lord, this third visitor is none other than Yahweh. None other than the covenant God of Israel in the future. But look at The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? God's on the way to Sodom to take a look. And uh, he asked himself this question. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm going to do? I wonder, does God ever ask that about you? Are you that intimate with God? Are you that friendly basis with God that God would say, shall I hide from you? Put your name in there. Shall I hide from you what I'm planning to do? I think most of the time we have God's plan hidden for, from us because we're not interested. We're not tuned into God's plan. We're tuned into our own plan. We're tuned into earthly things, and so we miss 
this kind of question. Basically, he says, shall I, shall I share with Abraham my problem? Yeah, God has a problem. It's called Sodom and Gomorrah. He has a dilemma because he doesn't want to wipe them out. Shall I share with Abraham my problem, my plan, my purpose, my desires? Should I tell him what I'm going to do? Because if he doesn't know what I'm going to do, then he can't do anything. But if he knows, perhaps he'll join me in my purposes. Verse 18, there is a revealing in that questioning. He says, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? God goes back to that covenant, doesn't he, in, in chapter 12 and verse 3. Uh, how's the verse go, the third verse? I will bless him that blesses thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee, Abram, shall all the families or the nations of the earth be blessed. So God's going back to that to original covenant in chapter 12 and verse 3, that Abram is going to be a covenant blessing to the entire world. By the way, that should make it obvious why the Jewish people are important to God. Because this hasn't been completely fulfilled yet. And this is really the thrust of the whole book of Genesis, if I might say the Bible. It is a missions thrust from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where we are first given a hint that God is going to send the seed of a woman that would crush the head of the serpent that would destroy Satan and all of his works. Why? That he might redeem the nations. And so it's a missionary thrust right here again. God's redemption plan, and, and what is implicit in that, what is implied in the words that God is speaking to himself, is that Israel is in my crosshairs. Israel is in my plan. I'm going to make Israel a light to the nations. I'm sure implicit in that statement of verse 18, God's redemptive plan is, of course, at the center of it all, Messiah. Messiah who would come as a suffering servant of Yahweh, who would give his life and shed his blood in order to bring redemption to sinful mankind, and to reverse the curse on this earth eventually. I'm sure that implicit in verse 18, if all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through this man, that God it has the church in his view too, of Jew and Gentile being the, the means whereby the gospel will go to the ends of the earth and bless the world. We need to know God's plan because God shows people his plan because he, he intends the revealing of his plan to bring about a personal, proper response to what you find out he wants to do, what he's purposed. Stop to think, why did God give us a Bible? Why did God give us revelation? Why does God show us this truth? And obviously, it's because world redemption involves human beings. The redemption of the world involves you. Every single one of us are included in, we have a personal response. We're invited from God to be part of this awesome plan. Look at verse 19. He continues talking to himself. God does. For I know him. I know Abraham. That is, I've chosen him. And he will command his children and his household after him. 
And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him, that God might fulfill his covenant with Abraham. There's questioning in verse 17. There's revealing in verse 18. There's choosing in verse 19. God chose Abraham. And by the way, I don't know if you figured it out yet, but whenever God chooses people, it's not for salvation. God didn't chose, choose Abraham for salvation, but rather he chose Abraham that he would be the means by which other people would be saved. And by the way, if God chooses you to be the channel through which other people get saved, somewhere along the line, you're going to get saved. It's really not all that difficult. God chose Abraham. We could say God liked Abraham because Abraham was the specific fulfillment of his plan, the means by which his plan would be fulfilled. And God says, I know him. He's going to be, he's going to be conscientious to pass on my plan to his descendants as well. So God chose you to save others. That's why you're saved. God chose you to save others. God chose you to join with him in his redemptive plan. I should say, isn't it amazing that God would choose us to be a part of his plan? to reach the world. God uses human beings, just people like you and I. God wants to reach others through human. That's why God became a man. God divulging in these few verses. Drop down with me to verse 22. And what I see in the first part of that verse where it says the men, that is the two angels, the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But it says, but Abram stood yet before the Lord. Second thing about God here, not only is God divulging, but God is delaying. The two angels left and went to Sodom, but God lingers to share his plan that he's been talking about in verses 17 to 19 with Abraham. God lingers to share his plan. God is waiting for a, that, crucible, that, 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 that crucial, teachable moment to give him an opportunity for Abraham to then respond correctly. God shares truth with us to give us the opportunity to respond to his will for us. Is God speaking to you? Is God teaching you? Is God communicating with you? Is God waiting for your proper response to him? How does God want you to join him in his purpose? I think that God waits for you. I don't know what you're going to do about it. God delaying. And then in the second half of verse 22, it says, But Abram stood yet before the Lord. God divulging, God delaying, and finally, God desiring. God desiring. Here's what I mean. That last phrase in verse 22, I have understood from studying it, that that, is, that last phrase is a scribal revision. And I'm not going to go into the, the technical stuff here. You have to trust me on this. The emphasis in that last phrase, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord, is really this. It's not Abram standing before the Lord, but it's God standing before Abram. Now listen to me. In that culture, no king, no king would stand before a subject. 
What God is doing here is deliberate. He is deliberately lowering himself. God is standing before Abraham, his subject. God is standing before a human being. God is deliberately delaying. God is divulging. God is doing so because he's desiring something. What is he desiring? God waits for Abraham and for the right moment to speak to him on the behalf of Sodom. The fact is, they're walking, the two men peel off and go towards Sodom, and God stops and doesn't go with them, even though he said, I'm going to go down there personally and check it out myself to see the level of sin, he stops. And it's him and Abram alone. And I think what's happening here, and, and really, if you get a hold of this, it ought to transform your prayer life. It ought to transform your, your understanding of God. God standing, God waiting for Abraham. Why was God waiting for Abraham? God was waiting for Abraham to speak on the behalf of Sodom. It's like God said, okay, I'm not going any further, but I am waiting here. Aren't you going to say something? Abraham, this is what I'm, the plan is for Sodom. Aren't you going to say anything? You understand the condition, right? Uh, are you just going to stand there? Aren't you going to do anything about it? Aren't you going to speak to me about this situation? You know what he's doing? God is standing before Abraham because he is longing for Abraham to intercede on the behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. That is the key to saving this wicked city that we live in. To understand that vital truth this is really, in, in application to us, a call to revival of the believer. That God reveals his plan, and God is judging and will judge this city like you and I could not imagine. And God reveals that to us. God reveals that because he wants us to be stirred to intercede on the behalf of the city the cities of this nation. That lament regarding Israel in Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. I looked for a man to stand in the gap. He found none. He didn't find one. I hope that God can find someone in this congregation this morning that would stand in the gap and intercede like an Abraham for Sodom for this city that we are a part of. And I'm telling you, it's a call to revival because if we're not right with God, then this city has no chance. Because God uses human beings like Abraham, like you. So we need to examine ourselves. I really believe that what we see in Genesis, or rather in, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, where Jesus is at the door of the church in the city of Laodicea and he's knocking on that door. Jesus is knocking on the door. He's waiting for believers to wake up. He's waiting for believers to join him in his purpose. How long is he going to knock? How long are we going to keep him waiting? He's standing at the door and he's knocking. When are we going to answer the door? When are we going to let him in? When are we going to join him in his plan? Father, I pray that you would continue to take the truth of this passage, drive it deeper into each one of our hearts. Oh, may it be that which awakens us. Lord, we are so privileged that you would stand and wait for us to join you in your purpose. 
What a privileged people. How shameful it is to keep you waiting, keep you knocking. Today you're at the door of Bethel Baptist Fellowship and you're knocking and you're saying, if any man will open the door, I will come in and will sup for fellowship with him and he with me. Well, Lord, is there a man? Is there a single person that would open the door to you right here in our midst today? Lord, we welcome you. We open the door, we welcome you to join us as we seek your presence. May you, as you said, may your presence be found by us because we do so with our whole heart and we thank you for that.